Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Welcome to the North Shore Church of Christ. My name, my name is Tracy Washington. I'm the health care chair for the NWACP. And we would like to take this moment to thank everybody for being here. We also want to thank Pastor Terry Outwater and Sandra and the congregation of North Shore Church of Christ for extending their hospitality and allowing us to have our program here in order to inform the public about how cold pollution impacts our community. So thank you, Pastor. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Dulce, Candy Ortiz. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dulce Candy Ortiz. Uh, buenas tardes a todos. Gracias por acompañarnos hoy. And uh, today I'm here with uh, our fellow community partners, and we are pleased to welcome you this evening. I know it's very nice outside. The sun is shining, the sun is shining and the birds are chirping, but you chose to come and get educated, and we really thank you and we welcome you for that. Uh, so here we are today uh, to discuss how dangerous the pollution from Midwest Generation's 50-year-old coal-fired power plant directly affects our community. Uh, this event is being organized, as I mentioned before, by our community partners, which include the NAACP, the Lake County Branch, Most Blessed Trinity, Little Village Environmental Justice Organization, Respiratory Health Association, the Exchange Club of North Chicago, the League of Women Voters of Lake County, and the Sierra Club. Um, as a daughter, as a mother, and as a friend, I do have family members and friends that are affected by asthma. And I feel the air pollution from the Waukegan Coal Fire Power Plant hurts the health of our communities but particularly minority communities. This is one of the most significant challenges facing Waukegan as we work to build a healthy and clean future for our city. Opportunity begets opportunity, and investments in clean energy and lakefront revitalization will make Waukegan an even better place to live and establish more businesses. The Waukegan plan stands in the way of clean air in Lake County and our families and most of all our children deserve better. With that, I'd like to welcome Brian Urbacheski. He's the Environmental Health Director for the Respiratory Health Association. Um, thank you very much for having me here, and thank you for all, all for coming out here tonight. I um, wanted to give you some basic background on my organization and kind of set the stage for what we're talking about when we talk about air pollution and its impact on your health. Um, next slide. Um, my organization was founded in 1906 in Chicago, and our mission was protect, uh, to, to promote healthy lungs and to fight lung disease through research, advocacy, and education. So that includes part of my job is fighting air pollution, uh, defending the Clean Air Act, and working to promote strategies to clean the air so that everybody can breathe clean air, whether you have lung disease yet or not. Uh, we work throughout Illinois. Next slide. Uh, we do a number of initiatives. We work on lung cancer. We help uh, inoculate people against the flu. We work to clean up diesel engines. We work with people who have COPD. People with COPD are often those folks you, ha you see uh, that are uh, carrying their oxygen with them or, or pulling it behind them on a cart. Uh, we help people quit smoking, uh, and we help uh, prevent children from starting smoking. Next slide. So, uh, a lot of words. I wanted to say kind of like why we're here tonight and why, why we're talking about coal-fired power plants. Um, Jonathan Levy was an assistant professor at the Harvard School of Public Health. And in, in 2001, he, did a, he and his colleagues did a study looking at the effect of nine power plants in northern Illinois and what health impacts they would expect to see from the pollution that was coming out of those plants. So they looked at what came out of those plants, they looked at where it would travel, they looked at how it would fall to the ground and where people would breathe it, and then what impact that would have on people when they breathed that amount of 
pollution that was falling down to the ground. So this study was done over 10 years ago. Uh, and it was the first real gauge of health damage uh, in Illinois from coal plants. What they figured out was it was about 320 deaths a year were being caused by what was coming out of these nine power plants. And Waukegan Generation, Waukegan Generating Station was one of those plants, one of those nine. Fast forward, um, the Clean Air Task Force did another study nationwide uh, in 2010 using basically the same mechanism, the same methodology that the US EPA does to figure out the health impacts from power plants. Now they looked at the Waukegan Generating Station like a number of other stations and were able to tease out what the impacts were from that individual station. They came up with about 34 premature deaths a year, 54 heart attacks a year, and 570 additional asthma attacks every single year. An important thing to recognize is that the plant as it exists today is basically no different than it was in 2010. The same pollution controls are on it, it's operating the same way, so you would expect similar uh, effects every single year. Um, the Environmental Law and Policy Center did an additional report in 2011 using the National Research Council methodology for basically trying to tabulate the economic damage you would expect to see from pollution. And they gauged the damage from the Waukegan plant. And they came up with a figure of between 520 and 690 million dollars in health and environmental damages looking at uh, the time between 2002 and 2011. Next slide. Now, there are air quality problems in northeastern Illinois. One of them is ozone. Ozone is a caustic gas. That means it burns things that come in contact with it. Um, it's made from ingredients we put up in the atmosphere. So as you see, car exhaust is one of those uh, contribu contributors. Um, and emissions from things like industrial facilities and electric utilities, coal-fired power plants, also add to the mix that then cooks in the sun and turns into ozone, which again is a caustic gas that burns things. The important thing you see coming out of um, things like a power plant are nitrogen oxides. Next slide. So if you look at ozone, the entire Chicago metropolitan area is classified as not meeting minimal health standards for ozone. That includes Lake County. As you can see, there's a lot of other areas around the country, like St. Louis, Cincinnati, Cleveland, also that have ozone problems. Uh, these are big metro regions. They're big health problems. Um, I'll get to the health impacts on you in a minute. Um, next slide. Now, this is an interesting slide. Um, another another um, problem we have in the Chicago metropolitan region, in the entire south, southern Lake Michigan region, is what we call fine particulate matter, or what people usually think of as soot. Uh, Lake County is part of an area that fails to meet the health standard for this soot, also called particulate matter less than two and a half microns. That's the way the government classifies it, but go with me and just call it soot for a minute. Um, if you look at that picture and you see there's a log or something that looks like a telephone pole up there, that's a human hair. Uh, the big boulders next to it, those are pieces of sand just for scale. If you see those little tiny marbles next to it, and then you look at the tiny red marbles, those are balls that would be two and a half microns in diameter. We're talking things that are that small. It comes from a lot of different sources. Um, it comes from car exhaust, it comes from truck exhaust, it comes from power plant exhaust. But the biggest single source that makes up these particles comes from sulfur dioxide. And in Illinois, 90% of the sulfur dioxide comes from power generation, comes from coal-fired power plants. Next slide. So once we start talking about we have these two big problems in the Chicago metropolitan region, what are the health effects? Well, ozone irritates lung linings. Like I said, it's a caustic gas. It burns things it comes in contact with. So when you breathe ozone, that's what it's doing to the insides of your lungs. Um, how do you know? You're gonna be coughing. Some people will feel pain. Some people have difficulty breathing. Um, for people with asthma, it can trigger asthma attacks. 
Because of that, it increases respiratory emergency room visits, it increases hospitalizations, and you get several thousand deaths a year across the United States because of ozone. PM 2.5, those fine particles, they do the same things. They cause asthma attacks, they increase hospital visits, but it does more. These particles are so small that they can actually get to the deepest portions of your lungs, and from there they can actually get into your bloodstream. So not only are they associated with lung health problems, but they're associated with strokes, increased numbers of heart attacks, diabetes increase, and they're actually responsible for several tens of thousands of premature deaths in the United States every single year. Next one. So if you look at Lake County and you say ozone problems, the highest ozone smog levels in northeastern Illinois, and I'm thinking of the whole Chicago metropolitan area, it's in Zion. The monitor in Zion consistently is the highest monitor for ozone. Uh, it violated health standards four times in 2010, five times in 2011, and a whopping 19 times last summer. Now EPA is actually likely to tighten the standard this year. Uh, the, hands, the health standard really isn't tight enough. And what that means, there's many days out there where officials will say that the air is safe to breathe, but they're using the wrong measuring stick. They're using the wrong ruler. So there are many days where they'll say it's safe, and it really isn't based on the science. And hopefully they will tighten the standard to reflect that reality going forward. Next slide. So what comes out of a power plant, coal-fired power plant? You're talking about nitrogen oxides. Those form that ozone smog, and they also fi form fine particles in the atmosphere. Sulfur dioxide, remember that's that big chunk, and 90% of it comes from power plants, forms sulfate fine particles. On top of these things coming out of a power plant, you also have mercury, which is a toxic metal that accumulates in fish, and when people eat the fish, it can, it can cause brain and nerve damage, especially for children. You get carbon dioxide which everybody has heard about endlessly. You've read it in the papers, you've seen it on TV about global warming. Well, with the scientists, I, I just met with a scientist from the University of Illinois last week who's working on the, the national effort to address global warming. And he basically says, by about 2040, the summers in Chicago, the Chicagoland area will look like northwestern Arkansas. Now in 2011, in Fort Smith, Arkansas, they, had, they hit a record temperature. You know what that temperature was? It was 115 degrees. That's going to bring more allergies. It's going to bring more flooding, more drought, more heat waves. It's a big problem coming forward. And on top of all these problems, you have direct fine particles, or you have just ash and soot coming out of these power plants that also are fine particles. Next slide. Um, single largest source of air pollution in Lake County is the power plant. For nitrogen oxides, you're looking at over 2,500 tons a year. For sulfur dioxide, it's pushing 10,000 tons. Next slide. Now, sulfur dioxide also is a lung irritant just by itself. And a few years ago, in 2010, the US EPA actually set a new health standard just for sulfur dioxide. Now, it's hard to figure out what's actually going on in Lake County because there are no sulfur dioxide monitors actually finding out what's going on. But based on the amount of stuff that's coming out of the Waukegan coal plant, you would expect that you're going to see violations of that health standard over a wide area of Lake County. Next one. Mercury, same thing. Uh, mercury is emitted to the atmosphere. You're looking at over 100 pounds a year from the Waukegan plant. Um, and that goes into the water, it goes into the fish. And people who eat the fish are ingesting mercury. Uh, and the state basically says that fish caught anywhere in the state are under a mercury consumption warning. <coughs> Next one. So what's been done at the Waukegan plant? Well, the plant has the least effective, least expensive NOx controls, which were added about 10 years ago. They did knock down some of the nitrogen oxide from what they were emitting previously. They have a mercury control system that was installed in 2007, but it's capturing far less than 90% of the toxic mercury it's supposed to be capturing. 
uh, and they really need an expensive upgrade at the plant to modify the plant to capture the mercury to be able to comply with state standards. Uh, there are no sulfur dioxide controls yet at the plant, even though it's pushing 10,000 tons a year. Um, the company says that it wants to put sort of the less than best controls on the plant, you know, good enough controls. Um, but even though choosing the cheapest option here, uh, the company has yet to make any, has yet to make the investments in these new controls. So what's happening, you know, the company's already got two extensions, extensions from the state to install sulfur dioxide controls. They've gone to the state and say, we need a delay. The state gave them a delay. We need another delay. They got that delay from the state. The company's still fighting the US EPA and the Illinois Attorney General over alleged pollution violations. So they're still going at it in court. And the company has been in bankruptcy since December of 2012. And it's really unclear if the company is going to survive. So is it going to be cleaned up? We don't know. Next slide. Now, the real reason I'm here is because communities are vulnerable, especially when we're talking about asthma. Like I said, air pollution, both ozone and PM 2.5, the fine particles, the soot, triggers asthma attacks. And asthma is still growing. About 25 million people a year in the United States have asthma. And nationally, it's about 1 in 12 for adults, 1 in 11 for children. But African Americans are two to three times more likely to die from asthma than other ethnic groups. And one in five Hispanic adults can't afford asthma medicines. Something came out from the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta about a year and a half ago, and they were looking at what happened with the asthma rates for African American children. From 2001 to 2009, they went up. In 2001, it was about one in nine African American children had asthma. In 2009, it went up to one in six African American children. So it rose 50% in less than a decade. So locally, the situation may be worse for those who live closest to the coal plant. For children, asthma could be as high as three in 10. Next slide. This is information that was collected in part with the uh, Lake County Health Department looking at what is the scope of asthma in some of the communities around Lake County, looking at places like Waukegan, North Chicago, Zion, places with a high proportion of minority populations, African Americans, Latinos. And they looked at, you know, you can look at the surveys here. Surveys were returned from parents. Now, children whose parents reported an asthma diagnosis. Now, on average, for children, it's around 9%. That 1 in 11, so 9% nationally. So these are parents who reported an asthma diagnosis. 16% of those kids had asthma. So it's a lot higher than 9% nationally. But the bottom thing is kind of even more surprising. It's children whose parents reported no asthma diagnosis, meaning they'd never seen a doctor, they'd never been diagnosed with asthma, but they were symptomatic. So they were wheezing at night, they were having chronic coughs, they were exhibiting the symptoms of asthma. So potentially you could see something like in North Chicago, you add those two numbers up, you're looking at over 30% of children that could potentially be living with asthma. In Zion, about 28, 29%. Waukegan, about 32%. Those are extremely high numbers. And as I said, you know, asthma can make you sick. You require medication for asthma. It can keep you out of school. It can keep parents home from work. And in the worst possible situation, it can kill you. We shouldn't get to that point. People should be able to manage asthma. But it is a chronic disease that you have to live with. Next slide. And when I say, you know, asthma attacks send people to the hospital. This is sort of a picture of that. You know, there were 5,000 Lake County emergency room visits in this time frame. Uh, and the high in highest incidences of emergency room visits for asthma, 22.4% of those emergency room visits from Waukegan were for asthma. Zion it was over 10%. Places like North Chicago, 6%. These are the highest rates for asthma emergency room visits in Lake County. 
as you can see, a little lightning bolt there is where the power plant is. Last slide. So I'll wrap it up here. Say we're a coalition member of the Clean Power Lake County campaign. We're committed to working on this issue to, re to achieve a reasonable retirement date for this local source of air pollution because of what it contributes to local air pollution and a decline in local air quality. We're working to educate people in Lake County about asthma in general and to how to prevent asthma attacks. We're working in communities offering classes and schools and other community institutions to teach people the skills of how to avoid and how to deal with asthma. I mean, we're teaching school teachers, nurses, um, clergy members how to recognize asthma, how to make sure that they know how to deal with those situations because as I said it is a growing problem and especially in communities in Lake County we have a lot of children with asthma. So if you're interested in learning more about asthma or setting up an event at your child's school or your church or another location please let us know. There's a sign-in sheet in the back uh, where you came in. We'd love to contact you and teach you and others about asthma. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. That was great information. And, you know, just to give you a basic idea, I know Brian threw out a lot of statistics out there. But let me just tell you that um, recently, it was actually in the New Sun, uh, Midwest Generation burns seven to 8,000 pounds of coal per day. So that's per day. I don't think that's healthy. And as Brian stated, our statistics show by the rate of the asthma attacks and the rate of the emergency visits. Um, thank you, Brian, again. And here to discuss the NAACP Cold Blooded Report, I'd like to introduce Chief Jennifer Witherspoon, who is president of the NAACP Lake County Branch. Good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, I think Brian gave me a segue. Uh, you can probably imagine why the NAACP is a part of this. But let me give you a, a history, a little bit of the history of the NAACP. Um, this organization is over 104 years old, and it's been the leading advocate for social justice and equality for people of color. Since 1909, there have been thousands of advocates that try to make sure that not only ensure civil rights for others, but climate, we have a division called uh, climate justice too. And it was because of this division that the NAACP partnered with the Sierra Club and some more members to do, to release what we call the cold blooded report. Um, there were copies, executive summary of the cold blooded report. It's like 33 pages long. But basically, in a nutshell, um, let, let me just kind of summarize it for you. Um, this, re this report focuses on the role that coal-fired power plants have in inequitable health c outcomes for low-income income people of co and people of color. Now, let me give you a little bit of history. Most of the, the coal plants that are in the United States, when they originally were built, they were built in low-income areas. And since then, that population has moved out, and it's, you know, other low-income people are now in those areas. And the people that are in those areas that is closest to these plants are African American and Hispanics. So that caused us to say, okay, what's really going on here? And we did a research. We researched over 378 power, coal burning power plants in the U.S. And we ranked the one that's, get worse, like, the one that's down here, it was number 12. The 12 worst coal burning plant in the United States. Slide, please. And now, see, the analysis, it looked at air emissions, that is, what was coming out what happens when the coal plants release these toxins, these pollutants in the air? And it caused us to realize that the plants knew that they were having an impact, a negative impact on these communities. But the reason why they continued to do it was money. It was money. 
And it's because of that reason we partnered with the Sierra Club to make some changes. Um, next slide, please. I don't know if you can see this, but they rank, it's a ranking of 75 um, plants. As you can see, Illinois is, is, is you know, number nine. And as Brian said, the, the, the impact is, is, is just unbelievable. I don't understand why we still allow them to do what they're doing to our kids. Most of us in here have children, and it's really impacting the children. And that's, what, that's why another reason why I'm so passionate about partnering with the Sierra Club. You know, i got to say this, too, because I talked to Christine about this. It, it really kind of upset me. I don't know if you, you saw in the news, Sun, they had a picture of Midwest Generation, and they have these falcons that were in the plant that come every year, and they have babies, and they talk about, they were talking about how they take care of these falcons and how proud they were, how responsible they were being. And I'm thinking as I'm reading this, but... but but you're releasing pollutants in the air that are affecting our children. When I say our children, I mean every American, every child belongs to us as, as a nation. And for them to try to pull the wool over our, our eyes by showing these pictures of these cute little falcons, it, it, was, it was just incredible. It was just incredible. It's, you know, it was just terrible. Next slide, please. The uh, top 12 environmental justice offenders nationwide. As you can see, they list the 12 here. Um, like I said, so number 12 is um, Waukegan um, Generation Station, Waukegan, Illinois. Those are, it's one of the 12 worst offenders in the United States. We have 50 states and we're 12. This can't go on. We need to do something. And that is why, again, we, we wanted to come together with you to, to appeal to you to fill out the postcards that are available um, to say enough is enough. And with that said, I'm going to end my discussion and turn it back over <laughs> to Dulce. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And again, um, actually, it, it's an extreme honor to introduce the following individual. Um, she, her name is Kim Wasserman Nieto, and she is the director of the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization. She recently uh, won the prestigious Goldman Environmental Award for North America for her long struggle to retire Midwest Generations Fisk and Crawford coal plants in Chicago. short. Hello. Can you hear me? We're good? Okay. So first and foremost, thank you very much for inviting me up here. I've never been to Waukegan before, and it's a true honor as a somewhat young woman from the southwest side of Chicago to come this far north. So thank you very, very much. Greatly appreciate it. Um, and, you know, I it's a true honor not just to come here um, and meet with some amazing folks who live in Waukegan, but just, you know, to hear Brian um, and folks talk about you know, the reality of what's happening in our communities. You know, southwest side of Chicago, northwest side of Chicago, Waukegan, Zion, you know, I think the reality is, and what we're really seeing is, we're all getting screwed. Let's just put it out there. You know, if we're poor, if we're people of color, we don't have a voice, we can get discriminated against. And the reality is, is that if this does not enrage you to the point of taking action, I honestly don't know what does. You know, the fact that falcons are more important than our children should just be like really like I don't even, the words that I want to say I can't say because we're in a church so but I think the reality is is that it's a true honor because for uh, you know for myself I'm a 36 year old Chicana from the southwest side of Chicago dropped out of college at the age of 21 when my first son was born and I you know I never really knew what I wanted to do with my life I knew I liked talking kind of good at it um you know and I love my neighborhood very very much um and when my first son had his first asthma attack at three months, you know, I did what everybody else did. I went to the hospital, sat there for about eight hours with a nebulizer in his face, and I got mad. And as doctors came in and started to talk to me, do I smoke at home? Do I have cockroaches? 
you know, what is the situation in my household? You know, I looked at them and I was like, why is this about blaming me? You know, ha can you explain to me how does this happen? Is it something I ate? Is it something I did? Did I not take care of myself properly at the age of 21, being pregnant? And I realized that not only was there a stereotype towards me, being a young single mom, um, low income woman of color, but there was also a stereotype that I would not understand what asthma was. I will not understand how this happened, much less can I actually do anything about it. You know, and so I started talking with folks. I started talking and I wanted to understand how is it that my child got asthma? Did I do something wrong so that I could not do it again? And what I learned was that asthma is not something that you pass on to your child. It's based on your environment. So that really made me question. Most people stop there and say, all right, well, you know, just crappy air. We live in Chicago, no big deal. But I wanted to understand more. And so what I started doing was started working with El Vejo and started going door to door and started talking to people. And I took my baby in my little sack, my baby bajorn sack, knocked on doors. People felt sorry, felt not sorry for me, but people were like, oh, mom with the baby and wants to chit chat at 12 o'clock in the day. Come on in. Let's have a conversation. You know? And I started to realize that a lot of people in our neighborhood had children with asthma, had seniors with respiratory problems. A lot of times they didn't know that it was asthma. A lot of times they didn't realize it was based on environment. But how is it that so many people in our neighborhood have asthma when, as Brian mentioned, across the nation, Mexican and Mexican Americans technically have a low rate of asthma, but not in our neighborhood? And how is that and how was that? And so walking around, talking with our neighbors, we decided to go walk around the neighborhood and understand, well, what industry is in our neighborhood? This, this has got to be coming from somewhere. It's just not by pure in coincidence. And lo and behold, in walking around our neighborhood, we found ourselves a coal power plant. Most of our young people had no idea what it was. You asked our folks back in the day what that coal power plant was and our young people called it the cloud factory because white smoke came out of those smokestacks. And how could white smoke hurt you? How could something that looks so pretty hurt you, harm you, cause you problems? Nobody that we knew worked there. I think the closest we got was we met a girl whose boyfriend dated a had a cousin who dated a guy who might have worked there, was the closest we found, but we could not actually find anybody who physically worked in that plant. So we, could, we didn't understand, well, what happens there? What goes on there? And we started doing our research, and thankfully enough, and I never knew why, but Harvard School of Public Health released this report. And the report comes out, and I get a phone call from very lovely Brian Urbachowski, and he says, you would really be interested, you should read this report, it's very interesting. And in this report, it talks about, you know, 41 premature deaths a year, you know, X amount of asthma attacks, X amount of emergency room visits. And our folks had that light bulb moment of, I knew it. We knew that this plant was doing something wrong. We knew that our community was being impacted, but we had no way of proving it, right? How do you show that that air particle that's coming out of the smokestack is going directly into your lungs and is going to cause some problems in your lungs? Right? How, do, how, do we, how do we prove that? Right? And so this report not only get, empowered us with the knowledge that we needed, but it empowered us to take action. You know, and sitting here, I counted 34 people. Every year, your community is losing this chunk of people right here. I guess the question becomes, you have to ask yourself, what, is, what are y'all worth? What are you all worth? Are you worth a certain amount of donations to a local school? Are you worth a certain grant? to the Chamber of Commerce, what is your monetary worth, or that of your child, for that matter? And so our community began to ask those questions. And so the first thing I will say is, as a community, you have to come together and know what you stand for. Know what you will and will not take. You have to stand your ground because nobody else will stand it for you. And that is the God honest truth. Organizations will come and go, but your community is the one that is the direct, directly impact. You are the frontline community. And if you don't speak for yourselves, you better believe that somebody else will. And somebody else will sell you out and throw you under the bus in a heartbeat if Midwest Generation wants to play ball with them instead of you. And so the first, like I said, the first thing is you all have to come together and know what are your principles and more importantly, never give in. We fought this company for 15 years. 15 years, my son turned 15 this year, and I don't regret a minute of it, because I did this for him. I now have three children. Two of them have asthma. My littlest one does not. And every day that I got up, I thought of them, because how dare they 
put out electricity that's outdated, contaminate the air that I breathe in my community, for what? For some money? We're being sacrificed? So some company can make money? Where do we draw the line? Along with that, what we really started to do was understand our target. You know, yeah, we can go out there and protest till the cows come home, but what do we know about Midwest Generation? How much does their CEO make? How much does their CFO make? Who are they giving money to? Will they stand up for you? Can you question them? In our case, our local chamber of commerce was getting grant money from Midwest Generation. We went to them and said $50,000 is worth 41 people in our neighborhood? $50,000 is worth selling out your community? And then when we, we, we painted that picture of the impacts that they were having on our community, they said, you know what, you're absolutely right. They no longer requested grants from Midwest Generation and actually did a complete 360 and said, you know what, we don't want your money anymore. We'll find it from somebody else. That's the kind of accountability you need to have not only with yourselves, but with the organizations in this community. Because like I said, these are hard times. Organizations and individuals are looking to make money wherever they can, but that does not mean that they need to be selling us out in that process. And so you need to know your target. What are the permits? What are the compliances? These guys think that we don't know anything. They think that because we're poor, we're brown, we're white, we can't read. We, what do we know? We don't know anything. We don't know about permits. We don't know about uh, compliances. We don't know about regulations. <laughs> Ask me about a Title V permit any day of the week. Why? Because I did my homework. That is why. What is Edison International's mission statement? You know, they have the largest portfolio of renewable energy, but it's cool to kill the people in our neighborhood? Where's the renewable energy in our neighborhood? How come the other neighborhoods are worth that investment, but not us? What do you have against us? Why, because again, because you think that we don't know any better, you can just come in here? I don't think so. And so definitely arm yourselves to know who your target is. Um, because the reality is, is that the more we empower our community members, the more our neighbors can be talking to each other about the reality of who Midwest Generation is and what they do. Because then it's not a story about the, what were the eagles? Falcons? Then it's not a story about falcons. Then it's really a story about what are the economic impacts in our communities. How many people really work there? That's a story I'd love to read. How many people from that plant actually live in Waukegan? Anybody? Anybody? How many? Oh, no, no, how many people who work at the plant live at Waukegan? See? Anybody? Anybody? Oh, I apologize. Hello, Alderman Cunningham. Very nice to meet you. Would you happen to know how many people who work at the plant live in Waukegan? Okay, just wondering. So in our case, very good question. Very good question. Because that's also part of the conversation. For 12 years, we struggled to talk with the workers and say, look, you may not live in our neighborhood. You may not raise your families in our neighborhood, but you're impacting our people. Would you like it if we came out into your neighborhood and build a coal power plant in your backyard? You know, this is not to say that we wanted to see those people lose their jobs. We understand that it's an income, and in these economic times, a job is a job, right? But the question becomes, where do you sacrifice and how do you measure the weight of a job with the weight of a human life? And so how do we, how do we hold Midwest Generation accountable so that they're not telling us, you're gonna, because of you, we have to fire 177 people? Um, I never said you had to fire them. What we can say is, can we talk with you? How do we transition these workers? How do we have renewable energy in our communities and employ not just those people, but our young people? You know what I'm saying? Like, why can't we be doing solar, wind? You guys what have like the lake is like right here, right? I'm sorry, I'm not from Waukegan. Uh, I'm sorry? It's the Windy City. Actually, it's not for the wind though, but anyways, look, anyways sorry. Um, so you know your target, and once you know your target, you know, you really, the, one of the main things that we did was we wanted to find allies, and we really wanted to build a great coalition. We had, a th we had to try three times in 12 years before we finally built a coalition that worked. And Brian and I were on all three coalitions, just so you know. But you have to do that, right? Because the reality is, is that there's going to be folks out there who are going to sell out, and there's going to be folks out there who are going to care and say, you know what, I join you. I might be a small business owner. I might be a small church. I might be just a nurse who works at a local hospital. I might be a teacher, but I believe in what you're doing. The more representation you have, the more our politicians can't deny that this is a unified voice, that this is not just about moms. This is not just about teachers. This is about the entire Waukegan community coming together and saying, shut down and get the heck up out of Waukegan and protect and clean our air.
But I will say, like with anything else in the world, when you come together as a coalition, be honest, be truthful. If people are there because they want the notoriety, if people are there because they want to be in the press, maybe this isn't the space for you. This is, why are you here? And more importantly, what are you bringing to the table? We're a small organization. We don't have a lot of capacity in the sense of money, but man, we can talk like nobody's business. We can pass out flyers like nobody's business. We can hold an event like nobody's business. You know, you want to bring people together, we're your people. However, we can't necessarily pay for an ad on the side of CTA. And that is where partnerships like the Sierra Club, partnerships like the NAACP, partnerships like Respiratory Health make a difference because they have that ability. But again, we don't want to be poster children. We don't want to be trooping out every time somebody has an event, let's take a picture of the poor brown people who are dying, right? And then send them about their way. This is real talk. This is the state, this is the state that we're in. This, we don't have time to sugarcoat and, and let's pretend, no, let's get, to the, let's get down and dirty. Because that is exactly you better believe it, that is exactly what they're doing. Downtown Chicago having conversations, right? How do we pick them apart? As we build a coalition, they came, I got phone calls. We all three community-based organizations got a phone call that said, what would it cost to get you to stop? I was like, that question right there is why I will never stop. That is exactly why. And so that's, I'm sorry, the sound guy's cheering me on over there. Um, but I think that's the reality, right? So you need to know, does your partner have your back? Or are they going to sell you out in the middle of the night? So be honest with each other. Be real. And there is nothing wrong with saying, I can't. I don't know how. I don't know where to start. And so I tracked my butt up here from Little Village because if there's a question, if there's a way I can help, I'm here to do it. You know what I'm saying? There's phone, there's email, there's Skype, there's pigeons, there's whatever you need to get me to share. I will do because... Very easily I could say, well, it's just about Little Village and Pilsen and, and we don't care about anything else. Heck no, man. I have family who lives up here. Every child, as my lovely sister said, is worth fighting for. And that is why we're here. Now with that, once you come together, be creative. I cannot tell you, I mean, we have young people who are like, y'all are hippies, y'all are tree huggers. I am not, well, I don't know what the definition of a hippie is, so I can't say I'm not a hippie. Um, but I, I've never hugged a tree in my life. I can tell you that much. Um, you know, I'm an inner city girl, and so we needed to be creative, so we tapped our young people. Our young people are fabulous at this stuff. And so we have done everything from classic posters, protests, um, to murals, but we've also done, done things like Coal Olympics. When Chicago was bidding for the Olympics, we came up with our own Olympics. It was called the Coal Olympics. And so you had to jump hurdles that were the size of, of coal power plants. You had to dig in a coal mound for an asthma inhaler. And if you won, you won a gold asthma inhaler, silver and bronze. You got to make it fun. You know, people these days, we're dealing with economic problems. We're dealing with education problems. We can't pay our mortgage. We can't pay our bills. So we don't need another problem. But if we relate to them and talk about the fact that this is all interconnected, you're going to hit a nerve in people. And at the end of the day, we all have a heart and we all care. And no matter if it's making a phone call, signing a postcard, or getting involved, people will get involved. Now, along with being creative, um, you know, again, they're investing money in commercialism. They're investing money in making us sound like we don't know what we're talking about. They're investing money in marketing. We might not have that kind of money, but we can be creative. In our neighborhood, gossip, whew, best way to get information out. I go to McDonald's at 7 o'clock in the morning, I got all the elders, right? I start with them. Then I make it to 8.15 on the corner to talk to the moms. It's a whole nother conversation, right? Then I hit the grocery store and the laundromat because that's where mom goes after they drop off their kitties. Our people are going to respond to their families talking about this. We need to make this a conversation piece in all of our households, in all of our schools, in all of our churches because that is what people are going to believe. They're going to believe their aunt, their uncle, their minister, they are not, and less and less will they believe the propaganda that this company is putting out. Um, and along with that, be ready for the long haul. This is not something that you win overnight. I hope to God you do. I hope that it is quick and you knock it out the ballpark. No joke. 15 years is what my family put into this. Brian's family. All of our families have put in long nights, long days, because we have one thing that they don't have, which is we have our heart, and we have our soul, and we have our conscience to put into this fight. They don't have that, at least in my opinion, they don't have it. Um, so be ready, um, be ready to go, and be ready to win it, because 
there's an expression that says there's a reason that pride and greed are, are um, the deadly sins. And this is not about pride and greed. This is about justice at the end of the day. Um, now, while you're talking about shutting them down, one piece of advice that we can definitely bring, this is not just about shut down, shut down, shut down. Waukegan has a plan. You all know what you want your city to look like. If it's jobs, if it's education, start thinking about that property as it's yours. We own this property. This is ours. It is going to become ours, and we need to start planning for it. Because nobody can argue, not just with the health statistics, but go ahead and argue with me about what's best for my community. Go ahead and argue with me for what's best economically for my neighborhood. Go ahead and argue with me about the educational opportunities that our young people need to be having in our neighborhoods. Because a school is a lot better than a coal power plant. A library, a lot better than a coal power plant. A park is a lot better than a coal power plant. And so if we can come together and start planning and owning that, that's one less thing that they can talk to us about. And the last thing I will say before I get shut up <laughs> um, is have fun and celebrate every step along the way. This is, it's hard. You know, nobody wants to hear about 34 deaths a year. Nobody wants to hear about, you know, 500 asthma attacks a year. But those are the realities that we deal with on a regular basis. And so this can very easily become sad. It can very easily become depressing. Don't let it. Own it. Go out there and know that you are doing this because it is for your community and nothing else. I am doing this for my people. I am doing this for my children. That is what I am doing this for. At least I'm not on the other end killing them for the love of God. You know, and so really come together, celebrate, own it. And it's the spirit of this fight that sets you apart. Um, a lot of times when people talk about climate change, again, it's our communities that they post your child out there. My philosophy is we are more than just the face of climate change. We are the solution to climate change. It is our communities that know how to turn this around and make this work. And please don't let any, ever anybody tell you any differently. Because like I said, I'm just a girl from the southwest side of Chicago. And all I have are my street smarts and my Chicago public school education. And that has gotten me as far as it has today, which is up here in Waukegan to tell you we are here to support you in any way that we can. And thank you very much. Oh, please don't forget to fill out your postcards. Well, you're kind of hard to follow. Um, thank you so much, Kim. That's very inspiring. Um, also, I'd like to welcome um, one of our guests here is Ram Villa Vallum. Right. He is the district aide to the Honorable uh, Congressman Brett Schneider. So welcome, Brett. Thank you. You know, um, I know Kim's son has asthma. And my son is here today. Ivan, can you stand up, please? Say hello. I'm, I'm pretty blessed that he doesn't have asthma, right? So how many of you here have a family member that has asthma? Please raise your hand. And how many of you here know of someone that has asthma? Keep your hands up, please. So that's the majority of us, right? My mother suffers from asthma. My best friend suffers from asthma. She's my little sister. She's my little running buddy. And that's why I got involved, because I want them to be as healthy as I am, and I want them to, li to live for a very, very long time. But unfortunately, you know, having a coal plant, you know, right around the, along the lake, you know, it does affect them. I, I do see it. I see it in my mom. Um, unfortunately, she does not have health insurance, so she does have to buy, you know, the um, inhalers out of pocket, and they're very, very costly. And just like our community is made up, you know, of um, low-income individuals, they also don't have the same access to health care as, you know, a more prominent lake forest that does not have a coal plant. So that does get to me because I see the need that our community has and I see the need for us to speak up. And thankfully, you know, with um, this campaign, we do have partners. So I think we're doing a good job, Kim, of following your instructions. 
And again, you know, those partners are Most Blessed Trinity, the NAACP of Lake County, the League of Women Voters of Lake County, Respiratory Health Association, Ex Exchange Club of North Chicago, the Sierra Club, Faith in Place, Cristo Ray St. Martin de Porres College Prep, Environmental Law and Policy Center, and also many of the Waukegan Art Galleries. And we need you now to become one of our partners and achieve our goals. And again, you know, as you heard um, Brian and Kim mention, our goals is to set up a retirement date for this coal plant and have a just transition for the workers and the site. Um, you know, goal number two is to, um, for them to engage the community members. And like Kim said, we have to own it. We have to own that land and visualize what we want for our community. I, my personal, personal preference would be, you know, just like the Lakeshore Drive where I could run along the lake. Someone can bike around the lake, right? And how, how is this being done? Well, very simple. It's the, it's called the Clean Power Lake County Campaign. You can join us. And how can you join us? If I can have our volunteers please come and distribute the little postcards um, that we are, go we are actually petitioning our community members to help us and sign those postcards so we can go ahead and deliver them to the CEO of Midwest Generation and let him know that we mean business. And also, you can volunteer. You can get involved. I know I see a lot of young people, a lot, only three. No, but we have several young people here in the audience that can also get involved and volunteer. And you know, at the, at the end of the day, ultimately, this is about you know, environmental justice, and it's about claiming back our community you know, to have a cleaner and healthier Waukegan North Chicago, Zion, Lake County. But overall, you know, my son does not suffer from asthma, but like Kim said, you, you will get it from the environment, from, you know, from where you, your community is. And if your community is affected by, you know, pollution and coal plants, then he might be next. And we don't want that, right? So again, I like to thank you. I like to thank the speakers. Um, our partners uh, for coming to, you know, take time out of their busy schedules to come and educate us as a community. And I would like to now open the floor for any questions that you may have for us speakers. Yes. Okay, the question was, if the company is going bankrupt, which actually they already declare bankruptcy, why aren't they making their plans known? Is that correct? Why won't they close? Right. Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Christina Anaselli. I'm a field organizer with the Sierra Club. Um, it's a great question. Um, the company is holding on until the last possible second. So under Illinois state law, they have to make a decision. Um, they either have to install some of those additional sulfur dioxide pollution controls by the end of 2014 or um, close up shop. So we're getting into that time period right now where they have to make that decision, um, but they're going to hold it off as long as possible. One of the most important things about this campaign is really ensuring that the company um, comes forward and makes their plans known, and ultimately, um, there's there's no safe way to burn coal. So we really want to ask for them to, um, instead of put on those additional controls, set a reasonable retirement date and engage community members in talking through what that transition plan looks like. Thank you, Christine. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Okay, the yep. question was, is the federal government involved in this? Yes and no. Um, the federal government sets those air quality health standards that we're not meeting, not only in Lake County, but the entire Chicago metropolitan area. They set rules for what power plants have to do. But as you know, with the federal government, oftentimes it takes them a long time 
to get engaged, to do what's right. Um, and there's a lot of rules that will probably be coming down, uh, but aren't in place yet or won't take effect for several years. Um, but like, you know, we talk about, you know, the health studies, you know, stuff was done 10 years ago that, you know, noted that, you know, people were dying, people were getting sick from what's coming out of those plants. Uh, you know, how long do you want to wait is basically what it comes down to. Your second question? Seem like Lake Forest, the citizenship there would have a, maybe a louder voice. You know, have you attempted to let them know? Okay, so it's kind of a, a statement and a question. Um, the gentleman stated that Lake Forest is affected um, as Waukegan, correct? Yeah. And I mean, what about Lake County? as Lake County is, and wouldn't they have a bigger voice than us? or they would have a more prominent voice. If I could take a second, yeah. So I think, so we have many different partners on the Clean Power um, Lake County campaign, um, one of which is um, League of Women Voters of Lake County, uh, many of whom are members in um, Lake Forest as well. So um, we're working on building that coalition and ensuring that um, all, all different communities within Lake County are, in, are engaged. But at the, at the end of the day as well, as, as Jennifer, as Dulce, as Kim mentioned, this is um, ultimately a fight for environmental justice and ultimately it's important for this community here in Waukegan and in North Chicago to really be the, the leaders in, in charting this course of not only of the campaign but what comes next for the site as well. So I think that's ultimately um, incredibly important. And if you recall with, with the slides, one of the slides that Brian presented um, if you can see the pollutants that are going out, that, that are putting out, more, more, uh, mostly affect, immediately affects, I should say, the Waukegan, Zion, and North Chicago area. Even though on that slide, if you recall that, it, it goes out over Lake Michigan, but, it's, but it affects this area more. Uh, yeah, maybe it is affecting Lake Forest a little bit, but not as much as it's affecting here in Waukegan. Yeah, so um, just to answer that, um, the the plant and Midwest Generation as a whole, um, they're, they're merchant generator plants. So the power that's produced is actually so, sold on the regional um, electricity market um, out of state. So um, people here in Lake County and Waukegan do not receive this power. Additionally, um, Illinois exports 16% of its power. So um, in terms of actually replacing that source, it's not needed. And um, the regional transmission organization that it sells the power to, it's called PJM, um, has already done initial reliability um, studies because it knows what are some of the anticipated closures that might be coming in the next couple, couple of years. Well, Keegan is on that list. And so it has already issued at least a preliminary statement that our power would be fine um, should that plant shut down. That being said, there are a lot of great opportunities here in Waukegan and Lake County for renewable energy development, and those are things that we would like to explore further. Yeah, and, and just to say, you know, we, everybody talks about green energy, and people don't really understand, like, well, what is green energy, or where is it coming from? Um, you know, one form of green energy is not using the ele more electricity than you need. Um, you see these new light bulbs at the Home Depot or at the Menard store, you know, you have the compact fluorescent bulbs, they use about two-thirds less electricity. You look at these new bulbs that are coming out, the LED bulbs you might see, they're a little expensive still, but they're getting cheaper. Those use about three-quarters less electricity. As those things go into people's light sockets and in buildings and in churches, our need for electricity goes down. 
I mean, we're not, we're not powering all those incandescent light bulbs that we were in 1940, 1950 when these plants were built. In terms of green energy, too, you know, we're producing energy from sources that don't produce any air pollution. They don't produce the carbon dioxide that makes global warming. They don't make the mercury. They don't make the smog and the soot. I mean, wind power is something that's growing by leaps and bounds. There's headquarters that have moved to Chicago. There are places making the gears and the pipes and the tubes and the blades for those things here in, in Illinois. In 2011, Illinois installed more wind turbines, those big wind generators than any other state in the country. We installed more than California. But a lot of these are in rural areas, but you're starting to see them come into, rural, into urban areas. There's a produce mart on the south side of Chicago that has put in its own wind turbine. They have put in their own solar panels. There's a restaurant by O'Hare Airport that put in its own wind turbine. I mean, these things are coming, and these are things that will create jobs, they'll create stability, and they don't produce the air pollution that sickens and kills people. Um, let me just chime in. So in other words, um, we don't get the power, we don't get the energy, they get the money, but we're stuck with the pollution, to put it in simple terms. Um, yes, sir. Okay, we, we all feel more educated now. Um, <laughs> but what can we do collectively? Uh, we see uh, Congressman Snyder's representative over there, and there's collectively somewhere around 75 to 100 people that's in the audience. And until he gets called 101, <coughs> he's going to ignore us. So what can we do collectively as a unit to get something done? Because we've all been around for the last six years, and we've kind of seen how politicians work, because I'm sure that the coal plant got lobbyists. So what can we do as a community for real? Not just talk about it, but what's the next step for real? That's what we all want to know. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Fantastic. Um, so as you said, um, as uh, Dulce said before, we're passing out postcards. As we learned certainly in Chicago, the biggest thing that needs to happen is for people to collectively speak out and demand change, not only from the company, but from their politicians and really hold them accountable. We took the Chicago City Council and the mayor of Chicago to task on this, and we won. And we can do that again here, but it it requires people signing postcards, sending them to aldermen, sending them to the company, making phone calls, holding media events, and getting our story out there um, in the news. So we're beginning to do that now. We had a first rally in, in April. We're getting over, we have already over 1,000 postcards signed. We want to get um, about 3,000 signed as well. So we're on track to that. If you have, have, haven't signed yet, you need to sign the postcard. Um, and if you want to take some with you to get signed, please do so. Um, volunteering for the campaign will be essential. And if you guys represent another organization or a small business and would like to become part of the Clean Power um, Lake County campaign, please do so. Let's talk after, after, the, um, after the, the meeting and um, figure out the next steps. We can certainly do it here, and there's a lot of different opportunities and things that need to happen. And I just wanted to add, I think, on the politician front, I mean, that is so crucial. We spent 10 years trying to get our alderman to support us, and he would not budge. And it wasn't until we did our homework and found out that he was getting $5,000 a year from Midwest Generation, and we put it out on a flyer. The day we put it out on a flyer in the neighborhood was the day he came out and said, all right, I vote, I'm in favor. $5,000, $5,000 is what our children were worth to this man. You know, and so it took, you have to find that niche. You have to hold them accountable. You have to put them on blast in public and be like, who do you represent? Do you represent us or do you represent, are you another puppet for this company? And that's, that's the real reality of, of what folks need to do. And so coming together, coming up with ideas, no idea is too silly in my opinion. You know, when, when the Greenpeace folks came out and said, we want to climb the smokestack, we were like, have fun. We'll be down here supporting you. Um, it wasn't for us. It was, but every idea is a good idea. And I think bringing it and sharing it is, the next best thing to do. Um, Question? I really wanted to address something that uh, both Brian said and this gentleman over here um, is, you know, light bulbs are a great way to go about it. One of the things about CFLs that is a problem is if you turn it off very quickly um, in a closet or a stairway, they burn out much faster than an incandescent light, and they are uh, uh, have uh, mercury content to them as well. It goes into the trash and then into our water as well. Um, and I think 
think something that's vastly more important than converting over to these light bulbs is just turning them off. Uh, turning off the air conditioner when you're not at home. You can't reduce more electricity if you're still run. And just, you know, having the light in the other room and those kind of things just uh, are just much, much, much bigger than light bulbs. Conservation is, is a critical part. I mean, we shouldn't be wasting. And we should be smart about how we use electricity. Um, businesses are starting to key into this. They're figuring out that they can save money by installing energy saving devices, new thermostats, new lighting systems, new ways to manage their air conditioning. And ultimately, they're using less power, which is good because anytime you plug something into the wall, you've got to think what's coming out at the other end of that wire. Uh, and we really do need to work on both of those problems. One of the problems is to create, make sure that the electricity we do use is coming from green sources that don't produce this dangerous air pollution. And we also need to be mindful about how, we, how much we need and how much we need to do the jobs we need done. Yes. Yeah, I'd like to point out there are roughly uh, a few more light bulbs that have been on in this area here than there are people. And the sun's shining in. And this is typical. There's all this discussion of the new efficient light bulbs. You really can't beat the efficiency of turning them off during the day. And I would say that Thank you. Um, any more questions? I know we all have great ideas, great statements, and please do um, hang around after the forum <laughs> so to let us know. But we would like to just have um, your questions answered by you know the experts here. Yes, sir. condition. It's not something you can really cure. Um, we don't really know what causes it. Uh, there's still a lot of medical research being done. There's lots of ties to air pollution. There's ties to genetics. There's ties to poverty. Um, you know, it may be a combination of those things that's causing it. Um, when I talk about asthma and air pollution, the, the lens I look at it through is like, you know, I can't tell you why all these people are getting asthma. I can't tell you why the numbers are growing definitely have thoughts, and they may be right on that. Um, there is some medical research that is showing that uh, people who live near high concentrations of fine particles are more likely to get asthma. Uh, there may be other reasons on top of that that are causing it. But um, looking at it from my perspective, there are a lot of people out there that already have asthma, period. They're living with it. Their children are living with it, and they need to ensure that they are able to live long, healthy lives with that condition they now have. They need access to medication. They need to be educated on how to use that medication. They need to know how to avoid the triggers that would set off an asthma attack that might send them or their children to the hospital. That's a lot of what my organization's engaged in. Part of what people have to live with, though, is when, when you talk to a parent who has a child with asthma, they're like, what can I do? I mean, Kim said, you know, she went to the hospital and was like, okay, you know, what do I do now? You know, how do I ensure my kid doesn't die uh, or doesn't show up back here in the hospital? They'll tell you, you need to get rid of the family pet that creates dander. You need to make sure you don't have mold in your house. You can't smoke in your house. You may have to go to bare floors and get rid of carpets. And that's good. And a lot of parents do those things. And it can reduce the number of asthma attacks. But the thing is, parents will come to you and say, but what if I send my son or daughter outside? I can't control that. I can't control what they're breathing outside. That, that is beyond my control. That's why I'm here today, and that's why we work on air pollution issues, is because we want to ensure that parents are able to keep their children safe. After they've done everything they can do, we, we need to ensure that the public policies are in place that ensure they have clean air no matter where they are. Thank you, Brian. Any other questions? 
Yes, sir. Okay, oh, well, the question was if Kim encountered any individuals that were apathetic and how was she able to overcome? Most definitely. Like I said, I mean, I think the reality is even now worse with the economic crisis we're in. This is another problem that people don't want to have to deal with. Absolutely. You're going to find people who aren't going to care, is not going to be a priority to them. It's really about hearing, telling your story and hearing their story. How many times does somebody knock on your door and ask you, hey, why do you live here? What do you like about Waukegan? Why do you stay here? You know, what do you like about the neighborhood? What don't you like about the neighborhood? Most of our community residents got involved, A, because we did the basic community organizing. Where we asked them, why do, you, why do you live in Little Village knowing that this is here? And even if you didn't know it was here, now you know it's here. You know, why do you live here? We talked about the economic benefits, right? Nobody works there. We're not seeing those jobs in our community, but they are definitely polluting us. Every time a child in Chicago Public Schools misses a day of school, it's $100 that school loses. Add that up to how many kids are missing asthma, multiply that times 100. That'll get some parents talking to you. You know, also talking about um, if, that, if, if that wasn't a coal power plant and we had something like green renewable energy, you know, can our folks get trained there? Is that job opportunities for us? You know, that's another way. Jobs, people need jobs. How are we creating a job conversation in our community? Community development. You know, a lot of times we're not looking at ec environmental justice and community development. Why aren't we setting the tone for what is, needs to happen in our community? There's a lot of folks who have, who have ideas about that. But lastly, I think to what this gentleman talked about, communities of color pay a third more in electricity bills than middle class and upper class Americans do. A third more. Low income communities of color pay. Bust out a light bill. Let's talk about what is your energy usage? Where is it going? Where is it coming from? And yes, we recognize that the coal power plant does not produce that, in, that electricity, but where does your electricity come from? It's coming from nuclear. Let's talk about that and let's make those connections. Environmental justice is not just about climbing a tree and hugging a tree and eating granola and not eating meat. Environmental justice is at the end of the day about our health, our communities, and what is happening. Economics, education, and environmental justice are all intertwined. They are all linked there, and it's a question of finding out the self-interest of our community members and making that d direct connection. That is what it comes down to. And so all we need are people who like to talk, don't mind knocking on some doors, making some new friends, and sharing this story and why they got involved to make that happen. You know, in my case, all I had to do was talk about my son and why I was doing this, and I had a shmuel of moms working with me. Because at the end of the day, it was about their story, about their child, and them wanting to fight that. I hope that helps. Thank you, Kim. Okay, we're gonna take a couple more questions here. We know the Heat is playing tonight. A lot of people wanna go home, play basketball, right? Or is it just me? No, I'm just kidding. Two more questions. Okay, his question is, how realistic is it that the plant will close down? And, and, uh, and what's going to be done about the nuclear waste, correct? Uh, I'm just thinking, and a park be put there, rather than having them to come up and meet some regulations. Okay, so I think, there, I think there's a couple of, I think there's two separate questions here. Just one important distinction. Um, there, there isn't a nuclear waste out there um, on that on that site. I think you might be thinking of the Zion nuclear plant uh, just due north. Um, how like there's potential for some contamination on the site, um, without a doubt. Um, there, they have lines uh, storage storage bins on site for their coal ash disposal. So after you burn a lot of coal, just like after a barbecue, you have a lot of ash. Um, and all of that still has a whole lot of um, very dangerous um, toxins in it, like mercury, arsenic. And actually, just last year, the Illinois EPA issued uh, notices of violation to Midwest Generation for groundwater contamination um, at each of their um, coal ash sites around Illinois, including Waukegan. Um, so there are important things for us to be mindful of about um, the cleanup of that, of that site. 
Um, additionally, um, how likely is it to, to close down? It's, it's a very vulnerable plant, and the power that they would be um, selling in the com coming years is less and less profitable, just based on the way current energy markets are. Additionally, to make those investments that are needed would require a whole lot of money that the company is really struggling to come up with right now. So I think with the combination of some good community pressure and engagement um, and really forcing the company to come to the table and begin that conversation with what comes next, can, let's be at the table and think through the next steps will be incredibly important. Sir, you had a question? No. Any other questions? So what we know about, um, there are many different sources of air pollution, certainly in Lake County. What we do know is that Midwest Generation, the Waukegan Coal Plant, is the largest emitter of sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, and mercury in the entire county. So this is, this is certainly number one. Um, there are additional, additional plants around um, the Abbott um, facilities um, just south in, in uh, North Chicago um, are also problematic. So there's many different sources. Um, the Waukegan Generating Station is, is most problematic for a lot of these different uh, source, uh, types of pollutants. So there's, there's a lot of work to be done here. Um, but I think for, um, for the time being, uh, the focus of this, this campaign is, is really targeting um, and transitioning beyond the, the coal plant. And I'd be um, excited to see what, what uh, the next steps would be in addressing other sources of pollution. Okay, well with that being said, um, I'd like to thank our speakers, the panel, for answering the questions. I'd also like to thank the church and its pastor, Adwater, for being gracious enough to open your doors so we could have this forum. And also our wonderful and lovely volunteers that were here since 4 o'clock. If you could please stand up or raise your hand. Thank you so much for your work. And most of all, thank you for coming, and thank you for getting educated. Uh, for those that could not be here, I know we all have friends and family members, and we all have Facebook. So please go like our page, Clean Power Lake County. We will be giving regular updates on there, and also you can share, your page, share the page with your friends. Let them know what you learned today. Uh, because again, it is up to us to inform our community to get them engaged. And again, if you have not signed the postcard, please do so. We are collecting them here today. If you would like to take some for your family members, your friends, and you'd like to get more involved and be a volunteer, please uh, see any of the partners, Christine, myself, uh, Chief Witherspoon, and please become involved. Again, uh, this affects all of us. It's our community, Waukegan is a beautiful city. I love living here, I don't see myself going anywhere. And I just want a healthier and a revitalized lakefront. So again, thank you so much for coming. Before you go, just very quick, Alderman Cunningham would like to say a few words. Yeah, I, I think uh, it, a response is definitely needed from, uh, from what was said earlier about those politicians. Uh, no, I know, and none taken, believe me, none taken. Uh, two things, one, uh, speaking with the mayor, uh, the mayor has kind of given me a leadership role in about industry at our lakefront. So uh, as you hear today, you're gonna be here a lot more, much uh, coming soon, that we're gonna be coming up with a, a resolution on ordinance that is going to cripple the industry on our lakefront as we, as, as we see it today. But we think industry has done to Waukegan has not been a fan. It has taken away a lot of good opportunities. I think now it's time for Waukegan to take its opportunities to move forward as lakefront development. That's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, as a person whose family member, uh, my cousin, Gertrude Hill, uh, has, has had asthma since we were a little kid, and as today is on a breathing assistance on a daily basis, just came home from the hospital. 
So asthma is dear and near to not only my heart, but our entire family. But I want to really talk to that gentleman who said the voices is stronger in Lake Forest. The voices is stronger as we partner. One of the best things I think we've kind of done right now is the Sierra Club, but I am a fan of how Cook County does things in different ways. But if they've been able to tackle chief of staff of two presidents, now the mayor and 50 aldermen to change and close down a power plant, they're on our team to partner. When you get ready to play basketball, football, whatever, you bring the best man or woman on the team to help you succeed. We have that. I think we have the ground team, we have the Sierra T Club, we have the others, now we have you. So that voice is no stronger than your team. We have a great team right now from a city council, this alderman particularly. We are ready to move forward with making sure our lakefront get rid of industry as it is today. That's my message to you. And thank you all for being here. Dulce, Pastor, as always, thank you, man. Fine, Newport. You know, I did get um, a comment in regards to individuals that would like to take the cards with them um, so they can have their friends and family members sign. So if you're interested in doing that, please meet us out there in the back. Uh, we'll be out there to give you more instructions in regard to that. And again, the more, the merrier. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you.